Hi, welcome to Teen Pride Book Talk. My name is Lucy and this is the program on AADL TV where each episode I take a little bit of time to talk about a young adult book that is representative of and inclusive of folks in the LGBTQIA plus community. The book that I'm going to be talking about today was written by a Brazilian author and so it is translated into English. It is called This Is Our Place, it is by Vito Martins and it was translated into English by Larissa Helena. This is a really interesting, great, funny, warm, unusual story where we have a first person narrator who is narrating in three different time periods. The narrator is actually a house, number eight Sunflower Street, and this is a house in a small fictional town in southern Brazil. It's a rather conservative town and we hear from this house during three time periods. First in the year 2000, well really right on the cusp of Y2K, so 1999 going into 2000. And then we hear from this house again in 2010. And then we hear from this house again in 2020. So we're getting three generations of people living in this same house. The book is about three different teens in these three time zones. They're all queer. They all have different stories, but there are definitely some universalities. And one of the very interesting things about this book, there are many, is that because this is a small town, over 20 years, you might see the same characters crop up or one timeline referring to someone else in the other. And it's really fun to keep an eye out for those things and also to see the trajectory of some people's lives. So in the year 2000, it actually starts on New Year's Eve going into the year 2000. And there is a girl named Anna. She's 17. She lives with her father. Her mother died at birth. We learn that she has a girlfriend. She's had a girlfriend for about six months named Letitia, but she has not come out to her father and she's not sure how to do this. Her father just thinks Letitia is a very close friend, but they are really in love and their relationship is going really well, except for the fact that neither of them have come out to their parents. Letitia doesn't feel like that's something that she can do. Her parents are pretty conservative, but Anna would really like to have her father know that Letitia is her girlfriend and to be able to come out to him. But he springs something on her right uh, at the beginning of January is that they will be moving from this small town to Rio and she's going to have to leave in a couple of weeks. And Anna's devastated because she's going to have to leave her girlfriend. And there is this sense that Rio is a much bigger city, that Rio is definitely probably a more progressive place. And Anna does occasionally have these thoughts of like, well, maybe Rio is the kind of place where I could walk down the street holding the hand of my girlfriend. But Anna's big concern is leaving behind Letitia and what that's going to do for their relationship. This is the first time she's been in love and it's the first time she's going to have to navigate either a long distance relationship or end a relationship. She does come out to her father and he is very accepting of it and he is really sweet with her and Letitia and he really is there to help her figure out how her relationship's going to work out and how you might not know everything right in the moment that it's happening and sometimes you just have to see how things go and then there's also this idea that like you have to take the value of something while it happened and understand that it was great and wonderful and that's part of the value of it. So that is the storyline that's going on with Anna. We get Anna's story alternating in these chapters. So it's not like we get all of one character's story and then all of another character's story. We go through the decades and the house is telling us all of this. So we're learning about Anna and her father and Letitia from the house. The house is a very funny narrator. It's an unusual narrator. Uh, it is omniscient. It knows everything that happens within the house. So we can't ever hear anything about what's happening to the characters outside the house, unless the characters are telling somebody else. But the house's knowledge stops at the end of the house. And that's a construct that's put in place by having this unique narrator. Who the house tells us about next, the next resident of the house is a 16 year old named Greg. And Greg lives in Sao Paulo, but he is sent to live with his quirky aunt in this small southern town 
in this house, number eight Sunflower Street, because his parents are going through something. They think he doesn't really know, but he knows that they're trying to navigate a divorce and they don't really want him around to see that. So he is sent off to live with this aunt who is kind of strange. She doesn't seem to like him very much. She has a video store video rental store in the garage of this house. And the way that he starts to connect with his aunt is really through movies. His aunt has a dog named Keanu Reeves because she loves Keanu Reeves and everything that he is in. And she also uses movies to communicate with Greg and with other people. And it's a way that they can start to understand each other. Up until this point, Greg hasn't had a lot of friends. He considers his father's assistant. This woman who's his father's assistant, he considers her to be his best friend. He keeps emailing her and telling her everything that's going on in this new small town. And she keeps saying, I'm your father's assistant. I can't really comment on that. She does to a point and she is his friend, but it kind of tells you something about Greg, that this is the person that he considers he's closest to. He meets a boy named Tiago who comes to the store to deliver food and they instantly sort of have a connection. And what comes out of this is this community of people, the people that Tiago knows and Greg and his aunt and people who come into the video store and how Greg and Tiago start to get closer and the support that they have and the things that they think nobody knows about them when in fact the adults around them not only know these things but are fully supportive of them living their truest lives. I really loved this storyline. I loved watching the way that Greg and his aunt, who kind of pretends not to really like anybody, become close, become this family. And she is beloved in the city. She knows everyone, she helps everyone with everything, but with Greg, she's kind of standoffish until he learns how to communicate with her and until they sort of get this rhythm down. And he starts to think about his parents who don't really know him, who buy him things, who aren't together, who sort of shipped him off. And then he thinks about this aunt that he's getting to know. And he starts to think differently about family and, and what is family and what does that mean? Again, we're learning all of this from the point of view of the house. The house is letting us know that yes, now it in fact houses a video rental shop within its garage, which it thinks is kind of strange. And then in 2020, the house starts to tell us the story of Beto. Beto lives in this house with his mother and his sister. It's 2020. We have now entered into the time of COVID when everything is shut down. Beto was on the cusp of moving to Sao Paulo where he really feels like he's going to begin his life. He is this queer teen living in this small town and he feels trapped in the city. He hates the, the gender roles and the strictness that the residents kind of perpetuate around gender and sexuality and he is devastated that he's not going to get to do this. He does have an online correspondence with someone named Nico. Beto loves to take photographs. He wants to become a photographer. And Nico has sort of started to connect with him and comments on his photos and they really get to know each other. And they become very close through Facebook and through Instagram, connecting virtually. And Beto starts to get some pretty strong feelings for Nico, but he's never met him and he's never been in a relationship before and it's something that he really wants. So he's kind of starts to imagine what that would be like with Nico. He tells this to his sister, which is why the house gets to know all these inner thoughts of his. Uh, his sister was living in Sao Paulo and then moved home for the pandemic. And so he's locked down in this apartment with his mother and his sister, but his mother gives he and his sister this task of trying something new together every day. It brings them a lot closer and it gives him someone to talk to about what he's going through. His sister doesn't always give him the best advice, but she listens to him and helps him as he's going through the difficulty of navigating a relationship that has only been virtual during this time. Now when everything is online and everything is virtual. So can something that starts in that way become real? And when he starts to think about it, Beta wonders, does he really want it to be real? Or is it the idea that he loves? So those are the three storylines and the three main characters. There's a real genius in looking at this coming of age story through the eyes of the house. It's this queer journey for all three of them. And 
the house does make it impossible for us to know what's going on outside of it. We can only know what's going on inside of it or what the characters are saying to each other that the house can hear. What that does is it focuses on the interiority of the, of the characters' lives. This is them at their most vulnerable. This is them at their most silly. This is them looking in the mirror and making faces. This is them dancing because nobody's watching. They're in their home. Think about what you do in your home. And if your home could talk about what you were doing, what it might say. It allows for this awkwardness that really reflects well the experience that all three of these teens are going through. They feel awkward in many ways. This is sort of a universality of this queer teen experience. These small little things that are happening to them that are eliciting the same kind of feelings and that's just part of growing up and figuring out how you're going to relate to the people around you and what it is that you want. Communication in this book is very interesting because in the year 2000 the internet exists but using things like Snapchat and Instagram and communicating that way is just this idea, this idea that doesn't even seem real and it goes from being this imagined way of communicating to something by the year 2020 that is absolutely crucial. It is the way that people can reach out outside of their lockdown world and talk to each other. It's just an unusual and very intelligent way to look at how important communicating with other people is and how that has changed for teens throughout the years. Number eight, Sunflower Street is a house with a sense of humor, house humor. It throws in jokes and it's good at reminding you that it is a house telling the story, that you are so wrapped up in what's going on with these characters and then the house will say something funny or say, well, I don't know, I'm a house or this is what I'm supposing, I don't know, that doesn't apply to me, those kind of things. And it brings you back to the fact that this is who's telling you the story. And I just really loved that construct for telling us about these three teens and sharing with us these details about families and about trying times and that's really what this book is about. It's about family and friends and saying goodbye and falling in love and it's about shared experiences that queer youth will have over the decades. It's a slice of life story in a way but it also addresses something so much more universal than that. I haven't read a book where the house was a narrator and I really enjoyed this one and I hope that you give This Is Our Place by Vita Marchines a try. I think that you'll enjoy hearing from this house as well.